Uh, I'm Anthony, founder and CEO at Seed Legals, uh, the largest closer of funding rounds in the UK. I'm delighted to see many of our customers over here, people I know, it's fantastic. So I see a lot of pitch decks and I see a lot of people pitching. And of course, the art of the pitch is a key thing to getting investment. It used to be that you'd head over to somewhere in Soho or Mayfair or whatever to a VC's office and pitch to them. These days, of course, it's all on Zoom. So the, the extra complexity of doing a Zoom pitch. So the idea of this event is a few founders bravely get together, pitch to hundreds of people watching uh, for five minutes, and then I dive in and provide some feedback. But the goal is everyone on the call and everyone watching on YouTube later benefits from the things that they see. Now, before we start, I thought I would dive in with a few thoughts on that perfect uh, pitch, particularly on Zoom. So there are two parts of it. The firstly is the structure of the pitch. And the second thing is the Zoom specifics, because welcome to the future, it's all about Zoom pitches. So let me start with that one first. So a few things. Number one, make sure your sound is good. Use a headset. Make sure your lighting's good. Make sure your camera is good, the right height and so on. Um, not everyone can do that. If you can invest in a 4K camera, great, do it. But otherwise, you know, it's often the difference between Awesome, I'm bought in versus I couldn't understand that the words are a bit gobbled. Next thing, at some point in your presentation, you're going to turn on screen sharing. And when you do that, it's hard to persuade your investors. You're going to change the world if you're trying to work out which screen it's on and it doesn't work. So what you should do is prep beforehand, make sure that your PowerPoint or PDF is set into read view with all the slides sort and the, the, the menus and so on hidden so that as you turn on screen sharing immediately, it's beautifully presented and you then set to go. Um, if you've got video that you're doing, video presents special problems. And what typically happens is someone starts playing a video and there's no sound. So if you are planning to do a video as part of your presentation, make sure you go into the Zoom settings and you'll probably need to switch the input device from your microphone to the video and then don't forget to switch it back again. So those are the just making sure everything's set up for the presentation. Now, turning to the presentation itself. So the first thing is to work out how long you've got. You typically have one minute, three minute, five minute, or 10 minutes. Today is five minutes. Of course, when you're on Zoom, you've got the luxury of you've got your computer clock on the side. When you're standing on a stage looking to bright lights, you don't have the luxury other than a big clock ticking down. So life is a bit easier. But make sure that as the clock is ticking down, your viewers can see the story arc that you're presenting get it to completion. So let me explain. When you do a pitch, I think you're taking your viewers on a journey. So thing one is, ta-da, here's an amazing idea that's going to change the world. Um, and something that you're going to be bought into, here's the problem. Thing two is, a bit more about how we're solving this problem. Thing three is, this is the market size. It's huge. You want to be part of this. Thing four is perhaps the team and or the traction, depending how you go, which one's more important. So perhaps traction, here's how we're doing. Then there might be the team. And then the last slide is, ta-da, this is how much we're asking for. And we're offering SEIS and EIS. And just like when you're watching a drama on TV in 30 minutes, you know there's a story arc. I think in a presentation, there's a story arc. And if people know that you're pitching for this number of minutes, they expect that there's the character exposition first, and then the body's found, and then the detective works it out, and then you're in, and there's a hero at the end. And you want your pitch to do exactly that. So without further ado, let us jump right in uh, with our very first one. So, Pooja, you're up first um, with Devi. Over to you. Awesome. No pressure after that. <laughs> What's the perfect pitch? But we will see. I hope I will live up to it. I'm Pooja. I'm the founder and CEO of Devi. And at Debbie, we like to think of ourselves as kind of the Noom of parenting. So in the same way that Noom uses psychology so that in the process of losing weight, you're developing positive, healthy habits, 
we help parents in the process of managing their child's behavior develop positive parenting habits. There we go. So I started my career at the Department of Health and Human Services where I worked with thousands of families and I saw a vicious cycle happening. Children would act out, parents would respond harshly, this would make behaviors even worse, and it spiraled into creating a stressful home environment for children and their parents, and it made children's social and emotional development skills suffer. What we know works to break that cycle is these evidence-based psychological interventions that are often used by child psychologists and therapists to help parents change the way they interact with their children. The problem is that these are incredibly inaccessible. The stat is that in the US, 30 to 50% of children could use this kind of clinical support, but only 8% ever get in to ever see a clinician. And the challenge is that it's extremely human intensive, it's expensive to, to provide this service. And it's only really available when your family is in crisis. And so after my MBA at Oxford, I started Debbie to try and scale up what I had found worked on that small scale with families. There I met Faraz, our CTO. He's a second time technical co-founder and machine learning expert. And Sharon, our chief scientific officer, who's a practicing child psychologist and professor of clinical psychology. Together, we are the team behind Debbie. And Debbie is an app that makes those evidence-based psychological interventions accessible to every parent so they can understand and manage their child's behavior, feel more confident in their parenting, and encourage their child's social and emotional development in the process. And here's how it works. When a parent starts using Debbie, they choose the challenge that they're dealing with, whether that's tantrums or arguing or aggression, whatever that is, they give Debbie a bit of context on that challenge and Debbie puts together a personalized plan for them based on how a child psychologist might actually approach this situation if the family came into them. In each session with Debbie, parents get, lear get to learn about child psychology, um, child development, behavior management and positive parenting, and they get some action items to do by the next session. As they do these action items, they get to track how their child's behavior is actually changing with these behavioral changes that they're making to their parenting. Along the way, if they need emotional support, they can get that from a group, a small group of peers. And if they need extra problem solving support, they can escalate to an expert. Let's take the case of Louise, the mom of a three-year-old who is struggling with her son's violent tantrums. She told Debbie a bit about the context of her challenge and Debbie gave her a plan to help her understand why these behaviors were happening and act to prevent them. She soon realized with Debbie's prompting that there was a pattern here. Her son would throw these tantrums when he was frustrated with a difficult activity or task. And so Debbie gave her four simple steps she could use when she saw him getting frustrated to help him work through those feelings. Within just a couple weeks, Louise noticed she was better able to anticipate when her son might get frustrated and help prompt him to communicate those emotions and resolve those feelings on his own. And Louise isn't the only one. More than 800 parents have used Debbie. We've seen 60% 30-day retention and parents have seen an average of 20% improvement in their confidence with handling behavioral challenges. And parents have found success with a wide range of challenges from just managing to get out of the house to handling bedwetting and potty training to fussy eating. We have a direct-to-consumer freemium subscription model and will reach more of our target users through online parent communities and forums trusted practical content and partnerships with childcare centers, nurseries, and complementary apps who recommend us to their parent communities. And this is just the beginning. There's a $24.2 billion parenting support market, but there isn't a dominant player. And the reason is because no one is providing the personalized, accessible, and quality support that parents are looking for. We can be the go-to for digital, personalized parenting support from the early years to the teenage years, but we need your help. We're raising a pre-seed round to expand our team, launch the product, and develop key features over the next 12 months that'll enable us to achieve milestones around growth, engagement, and conversion. We hope you'll join us on our journey to help every parent build their child's social and emotional skills so that they have a foundation from which to thrive. All right.
Thank you. So that was a uh, super accomplished. It was a really great pitch. Thank you. So I see a couple of uh, questions. If anyone's got any questions, we can go through. Feel free to pop them in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on screen sharing and I'm going to go through a couple of things. Okay. So um, number one, um, you've compared it with Noom. So normally it's the Uber of something. So I was amused you picked Noom. I suspect that of the people on the call, only a small fraction would know Noom. Now Noom's hugely popular, but it's not a household name as yet. So uh, you, you may need to explain what Noom is mm. uh, to people. So that was thing number one. Um, thing number two is um, you jump straight to the team slide. So normally I suggest, uh, well, if the team are well-known people, you know, if you're going to have uh, Robert Scoble or something starting a new company, he's probably going to just have his name on the front page and traction on the next page and that's it. But for most companies, it's the proposition first and the team towards the end. What I liked is that you brought the team here and spoke about your background and your team's background, chief, chief uh, scientific officer and so on is cool. But I think the challenge is there was then a mismatch between the imagery and you were talking about the problem. So mm -hmm. by putting the team here, actually you really were telling us about the problem space, but we were looking at the team rather than the problem. So I think shuffling it around would actually have been better. The next minor stylistic thing is I think, you know, you started by comparing yourself to Noom. And of course, in my prep for this, I went off to the Noom website, which is filled with vibrant imagery, um, uh, often food imagery. So you might think about um, the imagery is sort of a little bit bland. You know, you might say the words come to the front, but you might have imagery. It might be an app or children or happy, smiling parents. They don't have to be show, you know, having tantrums. It's all about happiness, right? It's a, probably about the theme is with this app the parents are going to be and the kids happy i don't have kids so i'm not the target audience but i'm, I'm guessing all right so mm -hmm. if you can bring out the theme of what would somebody empathize with as they seeing this mm -hmm. so i think the next thing is you've got multiple images of your app on the screen and I like things to breathe. If you were to show me this over four screens and make the imagery full height, maybe even put it at an angle or something so a bit more fits in, then you're elevating it and you're giving it more weight and more importance. Whereas here, as you're talking, the viewer is trying to understand the different screens, right? Mm -hmm. Minor thing as well, by the way, which is, you know, you've introduced Sharon earlier on, but you've got Sharon here again, and that then leads the viewer to believe you're actually really early on, were you mm -hmm. to show some other expert, because mm -hmm. otherwise it's like, hey, dude, it's just you and Sharon, that's everything. <laughs> okay, so the next one is you then came to the, the journey um, of uh, your, uh, you know, child and so on. And I like the fact that, you know, you're walking us through this, but I think two things jump to mind. One of them, a general point, which is, is a pitch deck designed to be used just as background and won't survive being sent as an email because no one will know what you're talking about, or should it be standalone, in which case um, it has to have words to explain the pictures. I, I'm a fan of different ones for different purposes. Yeah. So in this case, you've created one with as many of my slide decks are, there's like three words and a big picture and a graph or something and that's it. And it doesn't help at all to send it by email because the yeah. person go, dude, what are you talking about? But I think the challenge here is the windy river is a bit sort of East Enders uh, opening <laughs> scene. Um, the, uh, it, it's, it's less clear, you might have had four stages um, each of them maybe with different imagery of different happiness levels or something to mm. perhaps walk us through the story. And I haven't seen Noom, but I, as I understand, they might also have the sort of gamification of how you get to the next step and you might present it in, in that way. So I like the, uh, the traction, which you very nicely got to. Uh, the retention numbers are great. Um, I think the, the confidence improvement, you might find some other metric that jumps out as larger. I don't know if confidence mm -hmm. improvement would be the thing that 
you would be looking for. It might be child happiness or something like that. Um, and of course, you know, you know your month on month growth. If your month on month growth is great, show a chart. If the month on month growth is less great, just talk about the numbers and don't show a chart until the investor asks for the chart. So I think here um, you've got a lot of text and nobody reads these days. You could have done that with a smiling parent, an actual user testimonial of somebody saying that and holding a child, and then it suddenly comes to life. And just two of those, you've got my sympathy, I see it, you've helped them, it's awesome, and uh, as opposed to just lots of words. Mm -hmm. So next thing is, uh, let me just zoom out here slightly. So uh, go to market. It, Great. I, I, I'm not seeing quite the partnerships align with the go-to-market, but a bit more there. Um, I think market, I, I'll jump to the end um, over here, which is, uh, I think you've ended roughly on the, um, what we want. The, for me, the last slide is generally, you know, smiling founders, some delightful imagery, looking to raise X amount, offering SEIs and EIS, contact me. And how do you do on that? Well, breeze me well, you've got that. But then you've also got a few slides in an appendix. And of course, I saw that you uh, stopped before you got there. Um, some people love to put extra things in the appendix. For me, it's a bit like reading a book. And actually, the mystery is resolved two thirds of the way through the book. But as you're going through it, you're prepping yourself. There are another 100 pages and you go, wait, <laughs> there's something that didn't quite match. Anyway, so that's the feedback from me. Really nice presentation. I think one of the key things at the end of a presentation is you think back what did they do? What were they looking for? Mm. And if you can't remember that, then it's, you know, simplified again. So my takeaway points, the noom of child happiness, and I forget the amount you're raising, so that probably needs to jump out more. I don't think I mentioned it because I wasn't sure if this was like regulated, but it's... Okay. <laughs> um, All right, yeah. you, you're welcome to, but, but we won't do that now. So, um, so now let's look at quick questions. Actually, most of the questions are how much are you raising? So how much are you raising? We're raising a 360,000 pound pre-seed round. Okay, great. And that sounds about perfect for uh, the traction that you've got. So fantastic. All right. Um, I think you might have gone slightly over the time. So people were getting stressed as uh, the message came in. So you're on the time. So there's that. Um, and I think that is it for us. So perfect. thank, thank you, you so much, much Pooja. Sorry? Nothing. I just said thanks. All right. Thanks. And if anyone's interested, drop Pooja a note. All right. So next up, we have planned. Thanks, Anthony. Just to confirm, it'll be uh, James who'll be doing the pitch. So, James, over to you. Good luck. Right. All right. right. Hey, James. Welcome. Thank you very much. Share the screen and let's hide, you lovely people, and let's go. Big. Okay. So, I'm James. Uh, I'm the CTO and co founder of Plend. So, why did Rob and I start Plend? Well, it's because we believe that everyone in the UK who can afford a low interest loan should have access to one. It's that simple. Unfortunately, that's not the way the UK works right now. The market is quick, but it is not clever. So it takes just 59 seconds for a traditional lender to uh, score someone and they will put us into one of two buckets. Either you go into prime, uh, and that's about 26% of us, in which case you're laughing. You have access to all the best products and can access a loan on average at the rate of 7.3%. Unfortunately, if you are in the subprime category, uh, you are not so lucky. Uh, you are on products like overdrafts, credit cards, uh, and average rates of 35.3%. So nothing really much in, in the way of uh, options between those two extremes. Now, where it gets really interesting is a recent study by PwC, which said there were 12 million so-called near prime borrowers in the UK market. Now near prime borrowers are just as reliable as prime borrowers, but either through inaccurate or invisible credit records or minor blemishes, they have been pushed down into the subprime category and are having to lend at these exorbitant rates. The situation um, since COVID has hit has, has only made this, this market tougher. Uh, we've got a 58% reduction in low cost personal loans being approved. 
Uh, 86% of existing UK borrowers seeking further credit since lockdown, but over half of them are being pushed into higher rates. So there's a greater need than ever before, but traditional lenders are pulling up the drawbridge and people are having to borrow at higher and higher rates. Now, on the other side of the equation, we've got this new generation of millennial investors who really want to see that their money is uh, making them a good rate of return, but it's also making a difference. They want to know exactly where it's going and they want to know why it's making an impact. And existing peer-to-peer -peer platforms are giving them pretty slender returns. So what is Plend? Well, Plend is the platform that connects those two audiences, the UK's first social lending marketplace. Borrowers come to the platform, borrow at rates of between 10 to 25%, and they are uploading their images and telling their story. They are presenting themselves as a person, not just a product on this direct peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Now, at the same time, investors are coming onto the same marketplace, investing at really great rates of 10 to 25%, but they are picking specific people with a story and a loan and a reason uh, and seeing exactly where their money is going uh, and what it's being used for. Um, how do we get rates this good? Well, because we are direct peer-to-peer, -peer, we're not operating a loan book, which means we have radically reduced operating costs. That means we can pass on those savings back to our borrowers and our lenders. So slightly more detailed dive of the core features of the platform. So as we say, a social marketplace, a real peer-to-peer -peer connection with investors choosing a person and not just a complex financial product. Full investor suite, so you'll get all of the, uh, the usual things you'd expect on a lending platform, individual provision fund, uh, secondary market, and IFISA and SIP integration. Um, we're gonna talk also about the PLEN score. So we've got this, this, uh, this fantastic near prime segment. Now the question is, how do you identify that near prime segment? And the answer is PLEN uses advances in open banking technology to measure new data points and give us a, uh, a more bespoke view of the affordability of a potential borrower um, currently with Credit Kudos, who's our open banking data provider. Uh, so what is the PLEN score? Well, it's a new kind of score for a new kind of borrower. Essentially, we don't want to penalize you for mistakes that you've made four, five, six years ago. Uh, and we want to throw out data points that we don't think reflect the modern millennial borrower. Uh, things like uh, how many times have you have you changed address uh, in the last few years? Is your electoral record matching up with your current address? Um, do you have minor credit blemishes that go back four, five, six years ago? We don't think these things are, are relevant um, and we're replacing them with new open banking data points which allow us to accurately look at net disposable income and base our, our new credit score purely on what you can afford to borrow right now. Uh, and other clients who have uh, swapped to open bank with credit kudos uh, have had great results, 50% uh, uh, reduction in default rates on average across the board. So um, it does what it says on the tin. Uh, who's the team? Well, uh, I'm James, as I said, the CTO, uh, digital product project manager with eight plus years experience building large scale websites and apps. Uh, Rob, my brilliant uh, uh, financial brains behind uh, Plend is also on the call. We'll answer any of your more detailed questions. Um, he's got seven plus years experience uh, working with Deloitte. And we are really lucky to have uh, Kevin Allen as our, our CRO. Uh, Kevin has got a real depth of experience in bespoke credit scoring, uh, especially open banking credit scoring. He actually built the open banking credit scoring system for Experian. Um, and he is the, the brains behind uh, the Plend score and how we can correctly identify those near prime borrowers with open banking data. So what's the market opportunity? Well, uh, the personal unsecured credit market in the UK is huge, 210 billion, uh, and we are looking to target uh, 250 millions worth of uh, loans funded by the end of year five. That's 50,000 loans funded in total. So what's the path to plan? What's our validation so far? Uh, we've got five people on our team so far, um, including uh, a social media manager and a data scientist who we are in the process of hiring. Uh, we've got a initial uh, users and waiting list of 700 plus people who are waiting to beta test the platform when it comes out. Uh, and we've got 50,000 pounds currently raised from friends and family, which is currently funding the platform build. Uh, Dev roadmap, very quickly here, you can see that we're currently in development, but we are looking to go into beta testing between March and June, from March to June, so I should say, um, which will be used to train that plan score and make sure that we can validate our uh, assumptions about this new form of social marketplace lending, looking to go to launch in July and then add extra features from August. 
Uh, so what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a pre-seed fundraiser, 500,000. Um, and uh, you can see you've got some, some breakdown there of what we're looking to fund. So public launch of the plan platform, um, go to market campaign. Um, and uh, yeah, there are a couple of other pieces there. It allows um, the whole team to go full time uh, and it covers our, our, our legal and red costs as well, giving us the 12 to 18 month runway. Um, so look, that's that's planned in a nutshell. If you are excited by uh, what you've heard, then please get in touch. Uh, we'd love to talk further. And uh, Rob and I will take any questions that you have now. I don't know how well I was doing for time there, but hopefully. Yeah. All right, so thank you very much. I think that was also a super accomplished presentation uh, and a very nice deck. So um, I think what's really interesting is the chat. So thanks everyone who's been posting chat messages and the chat messages are almost a stream of consciousness of what I and I'm sure others are thinking as well. And so I'll read them for those who may be viewing this later and don't see the chat, which is you know, surely, surely there are lots of P2P platforms. How are you doing this differently? Uh, given the not so great reputation of some P2P platforms, uh, how does this differ? And also, you know, investors, the stats show maybe read a slide deck for between three or four minutes. You have to grab them within that period. So with that in mind, let me turn on screen sharing and let me take a look at, uh, you know, some feedback on, on my side. So. I think the the gist of it where you kind of got me and hooked me was the bit where you said it was a you know sort of investment for millennials was number one and number two you were showing a, a sort of a social good to it which is the near prime the subprime the people are missing out and I think you could possibly have made more of both of those. I think you could have used a lot more imagery. So there was nothing of showing somebody using your app. And I think this is a perfect thing, which is, you know, going back to the person who posted in the chat, hook someone in the first three minutes. So how could you have changed it to turn it into a story of some person who lost out and some person who'd like to invest and, you know, the bank's giving you 0% interest right now. So there's an opportunity. So there's, there's Bob and Bob is, you know, being turned down by his local bank. And here's Bob, uh, who's uh, looking for some money for something. And he turns to you because it's much better than other P2P lenders, whatever it might be. So there's an app, person on an app. Then there's Alice, who's got a bit of a, a money to, to, to invest and sees this as interesting. All of which is to say, I think that, by the way, I love the domain name. Plend is great. It's right. Lending and P2P and the land of Plendy and, and so on. So very nice things around the domain name. How do you capitalize on that? It's one of these spaces where, you know, people go, I've never really heard of them until it turns out you're doing like 100 million in lending each year or something insane. So now the goal is, of course, to get there and to tease out that proposition so that your core constituents, because you're of a marketplace, right, which is the uh, borrowers and the lenders are going to interact in the simplest possible platform. And here, I think, the fact to me that you're not showing the app means as the investor that you're not quite there yet in being able to show it. But for investors, they want to be able to, you want to be able to lead them over the believability gap and show that you've got traction. And one way to do that is to make it look like you've got the app. I mean, if you haven't got so many users, then of course, you know, show the mock-up. If you don't have it built, show the mock-up, otherwise show it used and, and so on. So what could you have done? I think the start could have been people using it. A lot more drama on the problem. Imagine there are 12 million people in the UK mm -hmm. who are losing mm -hmm. out. They can't get the things of their dreams because the bank won't lend them. You know, planned is here to change that. And now, you know, you've, you've hooked me. So I think uh, this is really your passion point, but it's sort of a, a bit lost in you know, numbers, how could it be done slightly more dramatically? Um, quick isn't clever. I think you've kind of led the user to a slightly off piece thing here. It's not about the speed maybe of processing by the banks. It's the fact that they, they're picking the wrong things or their criteria is different and you're tapping into the people, the, the unbanked, you know, seems to be a, a popular thing these days. All right, so I'm not gonna go through 
uh, all of the slides here. I think the, uh, the key thing to me is if you mentioned the millennial investor, then I would like to see imagery and I would like to see people using apps that, that really tie into that. And there are quite a few apps that look to reinvent banking and so on in that space. So um, the, the, the next one for me is show me the user journey. And I think this is, if you can show me how I would use it, either as a borrower or an investor, I'd be much more likely to be in. I think then turning to some of the questions we've had, um, you, you're welcome to take the floor and, and talk about them now, but you know, how do you differentiate from other P2P providers? As the investor, I want to know why you're different. Number two, as the investor, I may or may not ask, you know, how are you different to the Wongas or the others that have tainted the space? And that might be the elephant in the room that you need to overcome to make investors feel comfortable in being part of it. Over to you if you want to talk about those. Yeah, sure. So, so I think um, really good points on on kind of showing more of the the actual app itself, and it's uh, it's a misstep on our part because actually we we are kind of a decent chunk into development, and we do those screens you're looking at are actual uh, it's code, not just mock-ups. So we could have been pushing that a lot more through the presentation, and I think that that's an easy thing to to work in. Uh, someone also said a great presentation, but you looked awful due to your lighting. Sorry about that. It is terrible lighting, and uh, that is also an easy easy fix. Um, I think in terms of, yeah, look, the P2P sector, I think it's the reason why we say um, first crowd lending and true peer-to-peer -peer is because um, none of the other, the so-called peer-to-peer -peer lenders are actually letting you pick a direct person with a story to tell. It is all uh, uh, loan book, uh, you know, it's, it's also invest stuff. You know, you, you put a certain amount in, you pick your risk profile and they siphon off your money on a loan book to various places. Uh, and it's not really your money, it's on their loan book, even though they say it's still in your wallet. Um, so that that's what really makes us different. It's the fact that you as a, as a lender are investing directly in, you know, imagine all of us here are, are 200 profiles, each person with a story. I'm picking you, Anthony Rose, to, to invest in. I like your story. I like your rate of return too, but I, I connect your, your story and your loan reason. I'm choosing you to invest in. And because we're not running a loan book, I think a lot of people have said, you know, these those rates look a little bit um, sus. And I understand why, because, you know, they're, they're high and high usually means high risk. But that was why I, I and I maybe I need to emphasize it more, because we're not running a loan book, we have a like a hugely reduced um, uh, operational costs. And that's what allowing us to, uh, to pass on um, uh, these, these savings and these better rates is because we're, we're, we've moved away from that model and we've stripped it back. Um, so I think that's sort of, uh, that's where we get the rates from. And that's also, um, what makes us differ to the traditional peer-to-peers. I would say, if anything, um, the peer-to-peers in the lending, uh, personal lending space are misusing the term peer-to-peer. -peer. All the other peer-to-peers who aren't in personal lending also let you pick directly uh, the asset class you want to invest in. Um, so we are just sort of bringing it back to what we feel peer-to-peer -peer should be. Uh, Rob, what is that? Does that, do you feel like that covers it, Rob, if I'm not misrepresenting yeah. what we're... I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you're... Saying it's, it's, I think it's worth clarifying, you know, that there's always been a risk to, to an investment. You know, this is not comparable to bank interest or anything like that. This is completely different. This is getting into alternative investments and there is regulation around that. We are, you know, sort of regul regulated for that reason. So we're not here to like lose people's money, but at the same time with planned, every investment that you make, that's your investment and every return you make comes back to you directly. There's no aggregation or confusion with the platform and we don't hold money on your behalf, but actually don't, you know, use it for something else. That, that's a very different concept. It's all sort okay. of ring fenced. And that's, right, that's a key so, part of the, the marketplace. All right. So one of the joys of this presentation is you get sort of tag a tag cloud of feedback from people that helps you understand the class of things investors are going to ask as well. So, you know, really nice presentation, top tips, you know, more millennial, more showing the user journey of both parties. And of course, you, you need to address a couple of things that, that people are going to ask for. And, uh, and it's a huge space and one that can be clearly monetized. So it sounds if you get those pieces just spot on for the investors, potentially highly investable. So thank you very much. Now, mm -hmm. James spoke about lighting. And in fact, we now turn to Sam from Cicada, who's all about Cicada, all about lighting. Sam, over to you. Hi, Anthony, and thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, practice my pitching here today and, and as well with the, the large audience. Uh, very exciting. 
Um, yes, yeah, so um, let me tell you about Cicado without uh, further ado. Um, can you see that okay? Fantastic. Hi, my name is Sam from Cicada, and I uh, am telling you, talking today about my product. Um, so we're developing health-oriented lighting that helps to reconnect the body clock with nature. So we're working closely with Durham University who are undertaking user testing in intensive care uh, with a view to look at the benefit to delirium, which has been uh, really exacerbated under the current crisis. So on the team is myself. I'm an ex-pharmacist and a healthcare communications expert uh, with a background in pharmaceutical market access. Uh, we have on the Durham team, we have expert academics and clinicians. Um, our product developers, Wibly, are uh, optical specialists and are a spin out from Polaroid. And in an advisory capacity, we have uh, Eddie Guest, who is an XGE Lighting Senior Vice President and uh, with both the sales and marketing and a um, technical background as well. As you can see in the bottom here, we've also worked with a number of other partners. So um, we're actually undertaking a £190,000 Innovate UK grant uh, with Durham University as well. So life on Earth has evolved to a roughly 24 hour cycle in time with the sun known as the circadian rhythm. And as a result, the uh, ubiquitous artificial lighting we have in our environments sends the wrong information into the body clock. The misalignment as a result has been linked to um, problems with health and well-being. And in a literature review we did with Durham University, we actually found that um, it has an underappreciated impact on, on many of today's um, health challenges. I think someone might just have the microphone on there. So yeah, if you can mute that, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, and around about 70% of us as a result of this inappropriate lighting have uh, one hour or more of jet lag as a result. So Cicada presents light according to the time of day optimal for the body's needs. And Cicada aims to be uh, low cost, uh, straightforward, and easy to implement as well. So you can see on this slide, we have um, kind of the different colors of the light uh, that Cicada produces. And an example also of our um, product. So these could be from the 600 by 600 millimeter ceiling tiles you have in a hospital or an office, or also consumable. So it could be the bog standard. E27 bulb as well. I'll just show you now um, a short video. So um, this is a simulation of cicada lighting in intensive care. So at the bottom corner, we have um, a clock representing the time of day. And you can see this kind of like warm, orangey, relaxing light, which will be there in the morning and the evening. And then throughout the day, it will then transition to a much cooler, more energizing light, which helps to uh, center the body clock. So I'll just give you a sense there um, and move to the next slide. So um, Cicada is uh, aiming to be a health-oriented health, a health -oriented approach to general lighting. So um, we don't actually have uh, any viable competitors at the moment. And the reason for this is that other systems are very high cost, uh, very complex, and actually uh, targeted at different users. So Cicada with its low cost, its straightforward approach and easy to ease of use um, is able to disrupt light uh, uniquely for health and well-being. So uh, the market, we envisage Cicada uh, from applications such as the hospital ward all the way to the teenager's bedroom. So, um, these markets that we're really looking at are, at the moment, hospitals, care homes, and offices, as well as a consumer. And we plan to take this globally. So Cicada is seeking £110,000 EIS investment. And this is alongside its £190,000 Innovate UK grant. And as well, we've also secured a 
thousand pounds venture capital as part of this round. Um, we're using this to accelerate product development and uh, user testing in both offices and care homes, and also just to accelerate the time to market. So by year five, um, we anticipate our annual profit to be around about four million pounds, and this is just in the UK alone. So uh, we very much hope to see more than that globally. Thank you very much for listening. All right, so Sam, thank you very much. And again, our audience tag cloud, I think channel the zeitgeist of everyone watching and, and listening. So Sam, thanks for the presentation. Um, and we've spoken in the past, and I think in the past I'd asked, uh, I'd probably jumped into the wrong conclusion about that it was for home use. And I want one, but it's not quite ready for home <laughs> use and so on. So I think taking it from the top, and I think if we look in the chat, we'll, we'll see that we're not alone in thinking that. I think the first thing is when you hopped in to introduce yourself. I think the second thing is people like the founders to have seen that pain point themselves. You know, my father's was on dialysis and I needed to, you know, for you, I was locked in a cupboard for 18 years with no source of natural <laughs> light or, or maybe my story is I'm always up till two or 3 a.m. And uh, so in fact, I've got lights in my study that I change at different times of the day or night to get that sort of warmer glow late evening because uh, I stay up insanely late, but we digress. So, you know, to explain the backstory on your side as to why you came up with this. I think the next thing, minor technical thing, which is your slide deck has got very nice transitions in it. The transitions don't work very well on Zoom. They get lost and they look like sort of frame jumps. So think about if you're doing it for Zoom, then lose screen transitions and just jump from one to the other. Um, the next thing is you started really on uh, the, the wrong place. You didn't start with the problem space. So now let me turn on screen sharing very quickly to, to show you. So um, I, I like, by the way, the color scheme at the beginning, which is all about a nice lighting and so on. But then you, again, you started with the team, but you're telling us all about the problem. And while you were doing this, we could see in the chat, the audience was going, tell us what it is, tell us what it is. And we still <laughs> didn't really know what it was. I think you could have uh, introduced this with a lot more passion, you know, maybe play on COVID. The, you know, we're all at home, you know, time zone drift. You don't need to be on the tube at nine o'clock in the morning or whatever it is. We're staying up late. We see with our colleagues, this is screwing up our body clocks. We already see Apple and Google doing a lot of work. That's only on your phone. Can we do this with our lighting around us? Can we use the same technologies to do that? So I think you could have drawn the audience in and we probably would have all empathized with that. And then you could go on with, with the, the product development, you know, how it's a widespread problem, the science behind it. And then your, your slides with the science behind it would have been good. And then you would introduce the innovation UK piece to back it up and, and to justify that they bet on you. This is actually good research. So then I think uh, one of the questions in the chat was, is this for home? Is this for hospitals? And that only really became clear somewhat later on. My assumption is your cost of production and so on is quite high initially. So it's going to be for more specialized where you don't need to do B2C distribution. I don't know, but you would explain that roadmap and try to get people to understand that quite early in. So they see it as part of your evolution rather than they were expecting you to be in this market. They were going to go on Amazon to order one now and they decide that it's, it's not there. So, I think there was a minor point on my side, which is some of the things you were presenting felt a bit uh, academic rather than startup founder. We're going to go for it. We're going to launch this. There was a lot of showing the scientific credentials. And I often see that with uh, things that are you know, spawned from university spinoffs. The focus is about the science rather than turning it into a massive growth thing. There was a minor thing. I wouldn't say tardy at all, just a minor pickup on my side. Then I think just on the, uh, the presentation, I think it felt at some points you were reading slightly, bring out that drama if you can memorize it and jump to it and show how it's a problem that we all are drawn into, you'll get a lot more engagement. Um, on the one slide near the end, you had, which many slide decks do, I'm not that big a fan of it, which is combining the traction with the money you want. 
and I mm -hmm. like to keep them separate. This is my month to month growth. These are my plans. I want to earn this amount. This is the market size. Cut to I'm raising this amount with, with, with this amount. Whenever you have Innovate UK or other government funding, it's a nice validation. You know, it's not diluting equity. Sometimes it eats into some of the SEIS. So, but, but sometimes it can also be confusing. Are you raising the 190 together with the 110 or do you have the 190? So, so keep those, I think, uh, separate. So the investors go, oh, great. I'm investing 110K and the other 190, none of us had to give away equity for that. So I think those were my bits of feedback. Let's go to um, some of uh, the feedback. So one of them is you're a lighting brand, your lighting should be perfect. I think you definitely have that as a Zoom thing to, to make sure that's the case. Um, the uh, can I use a product in a commercial environment? Um, I think I've covered that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think there were some comments, which is really the elephant in the room, which is how do you differ from, you know, let's say the Philips uh, U uh, lighting and so on, which is very well known. And do you want to take that one very quickly and then we'll wrap up? Yeah, so thank you. Um, so yeah, just firstly, just re uh, sorry about the, you know, kind of, I felt like with the time I actually like was looking at, you know, what I was prioritizing prioritized to present so I did take out some of that kind of like personal story there just to fit within the five minutes and you know maybe um you know maybe re-looking at it you know we could have uh, kind of brought that in so um where we differ from Philips Hue is we're not actually looking to be a particularly uh, smart lighting system we're trying to get away from this kind of smart tech which is obviously uh, geared towards technology enthusiasts but um with a health user they, they you know they just want a product that's going to you know give them the health benefit but you know that maybe they don't want to be looking at the phone screen to you know uh complex you know for a complex kind of light lighting um schedule program so it's just really simplifying the system uh trying to almost take out the uh trim the fat of um you know to really get at this very specific health oriented um approach so yeah we're not looking to mimic or, or compete with philips hue and, and very much to maybe come in at a, a lower price point uh, as Anthony um, correctly identified, you know, this is probably not going to be, you know, a day one activity. The consumer will be uh, a later market due, due to the need of uh, achieving scale on, on the production costs. All right. So thank you very much. I think just to then summarize the mood music seems to be um, harder work to establish why it's going to benefit us. Uh, why we want it. And I think then leverage the fact that the work that Google and Apple have been doing to show it's a clear problem. The latest iOS updates seem to only come with new emoji and, uh, you know, the time of day screen dimming things. Clearly, it must be something significant. I think tease that out and then show how you solve that problem. All right. Thank you very much, Sam. So now, next up. 